Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm here with my cat, Leia. If you watched my last video, you know that uh, Leia has been sick. She's been uh, skulking around, hiding in uh, hard-to-reach places, and not eating very much. And uh, I took her to the vet, and it seems like she's slowly getting better. She's not all the way there. But now she's acting a little bit better. I actually thought she'd stay burrowed under there for longer. I'm not sure if she'll stay on the bed or not, but uh, I'm glad that she's getting back up on higher places again, and she's eating more, and... Uh, got the blood work back from uh, the vet, so things are moving forward. And it... Anyway, we're at the end of the month here, and I'm here to do my final September video uh, for the Anna and Eric Book Club. A couple of months ago, I reviewed one book for the Anna and Eric Book Club, Nine Folds Make a Paper Swan by Ruth Gilligan, and I'll link that down below. And today, I'm here to review two books. <laughs> one is a pick from their two August reads, and one is a pick from their two September reads. The first is the short story collection The Unrestored Woman by Shoba Rao, and the second is the novel Under the Udala Trees by Chinello of Peranta. <laughs> Sorry this is so jumpy, I am probably paying a little too much attention to her and I should <laughs> pay attention to the video. I think one of the things that I grappled with uh, in both of these picks is that uh, these works of fiction were very much responses to actual events in history and so there's this thematic element and then there's also um, my interest in uh, well-rounded characters and relationships. Um, the two things that really do pull me into fiction are characters and themes. When the theme of a book grabs me, it can really grab me. I mean, one of the big books for that was uh, Judas by Amos Oz that was published last year. I feel the, like the characters were uh, pretty meh. But I was fascinated by the themes of blame and misunderstanding, and how a communal narrative can erase complexities. But usually if I don't feel for the characters, then I can't love the book. And sometimes I feel like the theme of a book can be overplayed in the marketing and it's not there as much in the narrative. I thought about this a lot while I was reading An Unrestored Woman by Shoba Rao. Because although many of the stories do take place uh, during the partition of India and Pakistan, many do not. They're in the past or the future of that event and I feel like a more prevalent theme linking all of these stories is about violence and degradation against women. Also, just to put it out there, this uh, book is rife with trigger warnings about uh, physical, emotional, and sexual violence. But I really do like what Eric had to say in the video he made with Anna about the August picks, about um, how these characters adapt or don't adapt. Well, to the political change of the partition, and then, and then the specific circumstances of their stories as well. And because these are linked couplet stories, you can uh, see the progression of characters uh, throughout uh, two time periods. We have Arun, who responds to tragedy by exploiting people, and Jenkins, who uh, was an imperial police officer and then post-colonialism took on a menial job as an apartment doorman in the States. And then Bandra justifies uh, the cruelty she dishes out to others uh, due to the uh, bad circumstances of her own upbringing. And then there's Mustafa, who uh, did lose his family during the partition and uh, grew up to never say another word. And then later, Anna said something about my favorite story that made me facepalm, because why didn't I see that? <laughs> I'm just going to have to go ahead and spoil the story blindfold, which is kind of a shame because a lot of its strength uh, lies in the fact that it's an unsettling mystery about whether the main character, Zubaida, is broken or not. Also, this is probably the most sexually abusive story. <laughs> it's told from the perspective of this 19th century madam, Bandra, who abducts Zubaida as a young girl and sells her into sexual slavery. She's built this compound for herself and her girls, where the only way that anyone can get in and out is through leaving through her hut. Then one of the mysterious aspects of this story is how Straw keeps disappearing from Zubaida's bedding, even though Bandra is uh, continually replacing it, and she can't find uh, any evidence of uh, where the missing Straw might have gone to. And that confused me because, uh, spoiler warning, ultimately Zubaida escapes the compound uh, in another way through the front door, basically. 
And the straw ends up being stuffed into a window that Zubaida made for herself in her own hut that was uh, hidden by a uh, rug. Kind of reminded me of Shawshank Redemption a little. And Anna reminded me that the purpose of uh, the straw um, covering up this window was that it was a symbol of hope and freedom. Because Bandra purposely didn't want to give any of her girls an exit. And Zubaida threw that in her face. It was like a real emotional moment of defiance, and I missed it. Anyway, speaking of spoiling this story completely, I think I'll read from the ending. Um, even though when I first read this story, I thought it was a bit on the nose about themes, I haven't really been able to get it out of my head. So this is uh, the end of the story when uh, Bandra's pretty much a ruined woman. In her old age, Bandra wandered the streets of Peshawar. She wandered from the outdoor markets to the mosque, and then to Gantragar, and then back again. She had no money, and only rarely made a pittance helping to deliver babies, especially girl babies that needed to be disposed of. She was 80 now. Or was she 90? Little boys laughed at her and threw rotten fruit at her when she passed them on the streets. They taunted her, but she paid them no mind. Her thoughts were elsewhere. They were in another time, in another place. And of all the girls, she thought most often of Zubaida. Where had she gone? Did she, too, wander the streets? What else could a girl of 15, alone, impure, unable to return home, have done? In her wanderings, she sometimes stopped at various stalls and begged for food. Vegetables they were throwing out because they were spoiled, or day-old roti that they might be able to spare. Once she happened upon a man who had a monkey. The monkey was doing tricks. The trainer was seated in front of it, telling the monkey what to do. Somersaults, jumping rope, running and climbing. People laughed when the monkey barred its teeth and stuck out its tongue. The whole time the monkey was blindfolded. Bandra waited until the show was over, until all the spectators had left. Why is it blindfolded? she had asked. The trainer sat back, studied her, and she could see the disgust in his eyes. An old woman, a beggar. Her clothes dirty, smelling, her body bent and wrinkled, a mouth with hardly any teeth. He looked away. Why? Are you its mother? Bondra said nothing. The man collected the few copper coins people had thrown into his toupee. He counted them slowly and put them into an inside pocket. He began packing up the few props that had been used. Why? she asked again. The man turned toward her. She thought of the snake, the one Zubaida had challenged. She thought of her as a little girl, collecting kindling, hurrying home to an evening fire. The man held the toupee toward her. Throw in a coin or get out, he bellowed. Bandra remained, watching him. When he had finished packing up, the monkey climbed onto his shoulder. The blindfold was still in place. The trainer rose to go. He looked at Bandra and shook his head. She thought he might yell at her again, as they so often did, but he only raised his voice. It's a trick, he said. If you can get them to keep the blindfold on and think it's dark, even when it's not, you make them afraid. And if you make them afraid, he said, you make them yours. I think this uh, metaphor is sort of twofold. Most prominently, it's about the relationship that Bandra wanted with all of her girls, and particularly with Zubaida, that she wanted to make them afraid and that would make them hers. And that like her blindfold was like the fact that uh, she had them trapped there, that they couldn't get out except through her door. And uh, Zubaida, in these subtle ways that Bandra only got at the end when she escaped, was uh, saying that you can't control me, I'm not afraid, I don't have the blindfold on, I see the truth here, I see my freedom. But I also kind of thought that maybe Bandra had a little bit of a blindfold on because all of Zubaida's movements were so subtle and it was this sort of encroaching mystery about what's really going on here that uh, that Bandra was constantly left in the dark, that she was never able to fully figure it out until it was too late, and that it was easier for her to just uh, believe that everything was uh, going to plan rather than to question more deeply. Another thing I want to touch on on the part that I just read is uh, the idea that uh, Bandra was thinking about how Zubaida um, had to be a beggar too because uh, she couldn't go home because she was impure, because she uh, well, really, she had been raped, but basically because she'd had sex outside of marriage, you know, she couldn't go home to her family. And that's sort of uh, the big idea of the unrestored woman and uh, 
Shoba Rao talks about it in her intro about how, uh, especially during the partition with all of these kidnappings of women, they were defiled and when they were returned they couldn't go home because, you know, they weren't virgins anymore because this horrible thing had happened to them but it was uh, still against their culture. And India actually uh, set up homes for these women, and they called them recovery houses, um, but uh, Rao refers to it as uh, restored because I think she believes that, uh, she says she believes that uh, people cannot be restored to their original state, and so hence the title of the book and one of the stories. But I feel like the two couplet stories that uh, encompass the unrestored woman the most is uh, Zubaida's story, which First of all, not only was she uh, raped in this way, but she never was even the center of the story. She was always um, on the outskirts, and Bandra, her, uh, her captor, was the narrator. Then Bandra appears as an old woman in the second story, The Lost Ribbon, which um, takes place during the partition, and um, a uh, Muslim man abducts a Hindu woman and uh, keeps her inside of a hut, and, uh, you know, he rapes her, and... Bandra ends up uh, delivering a baby, you know, it's sort of almost like foreshadowing that part that I read from the last story. One of the powerful things about the woman in the Lost Ribbon is that she doesn't have a name. And in fact, uh, this story also uh, plays a bit with uh, form because it goes back and forth. Like, part of it takes place in one of these uh, recovery houses or uh, state houses in India, where the woman is now an old woman and she is recounting the baby that she had back during the partition that she had to give up because um, India wouldn't take a baby from a Muslim father back to India. And this woman didn't have a name because she was she was a pawn. She was used by first this uh, Muslim rapist and to be clear there were uh, horrible acts of violence on both sides of uh, the Hindu side and the Muslim side and and then also the Indian government uh, also um, didn't allow her to have agency or a voice and took her baby away from her. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but I won't spoil this story <laughs> as much. <laughs> and those are just two of the stories, the two that uh, spoke to me the most. But overall, the characters and the situations really popped out to me in this collection. I really appreciated the idea of these couplet-linked stories so that I could see I could see how characters changed and themes threaded between both of them in more specific ways than the entire collection, even. So this was uh, I, my favorite read of uh, the month. I just love this. So the second pick of uh, this video, the September pick, is Under the Udala Trees by Chinella Okparanta. She wrote this book largely in response to uh, anti-LGBTQ legislation that Nigeria passed very recently outlawing and condemning queer relationships. I liked it a whole lot. I liked the beginning, which talked about the Nigerian Civil War in the 1970s. There was some really harrowing imagery about the destruction that was going on. And one image that really uh, stuck with me was um, a boy that uh, rose out of a pile of corpses. And overall, both when it comes to warfare and other scenes, uh, Og Peranta writes beautiful physical descriptions. So I thought I'd start with um, reading about uh, the protagonist Igioma's uh, school days. Um, she had since had a little bit of a relationship with her first lover, Amina, and then uh, during part of her school years, uh, it's able to really blossom. The first holiday of the semester arrived. Many students packed their bags and headed home. Amina and I were among the few remaining. One day during that holiday, with permission from the gate prefects, we walked out of the campus and down the road beyond the school. The Akulo River at the tip of the road where we met it was narrow, but from where we stood, a point slightly elevated from the water, it appeared to grow increasingly wide. Weak waves crept up now and then, bathing the reddish-brown earth that flanked the river at its sides. We walked further and made ourselves seats on a tiny patch of grass under one of the palm trees. The earth was warm underneath us, having soaked up the sun's rays. Off and on, a cool breeze blew, and the palm leaves made whipping sounds as they thrashed against one another. Those leaves that had previously fallen tumbled onto the sand. 
At a distance, a woman washed her clothes. Sparrows flew. The air smelled of earth and river water. At first there was some space between us, but then I moved closer to her. We sat silently like that for a while, and then, after some time, I reached out from behind and covered her eyes with my hands. Hear it? I asked. Hear what? The water. Calming, no? No, she said. She turned to face me. Wrinkles formed on her forehead. Restless, she said. It makes me restless. I mean, that's uh, some impressive writing. You can really feel yourself sitting right there, feel the warmth of the, the sun-touched uh, ground and uh, see the woman in the distance and the sparrows and the laps of water. It was just uh, very uh, incredible and it uh, it provided nice atmosphere for Ijeoma's flirtation and how Amina is still a little more hesitant about it. <laughs> so, spoiler alert, this relationship doesn't last and I appreciate that uh, the book isn't a long post-soliloquy about uh, Ijeoma pining over Amina, that she does continue to live her life, and she continues to have feelings for women. But I think my main problem with the book is that I felt the most for it during these uh, lurid descriptions. But there wasn't as much happening under the surface. There was a lot of jumping around in time. Like, for example, Ijeoma and Amina met each other when uh, Ijeoma's mother sent her away during the war to be safe. And so we go on in the story and have a long build-up to Ijeoma's mother sending her away. And then we jump forward in time to when Ijeoma's mother picks her up and starts her on Bible lessons about, you know, the sin of homosexuality. And so we learn about Amina first in a flashback, and that just is kind of a red flag for me because uh, it's too much about hindsight then. And it's not about experiencing things as they happen with Ijeoma. And then we get to her school days, and I guess I kind of felt the same or similar there, because uh, the most prominent thing was these beautiful descriptions and her love for Amina, but otherwise it felt like there wasn't much else going on in her life. And, I mean, there was one other character who we kind of talked about a little bit, uh, Ijeoma's roommate, but other than that, it just felt like school was a vague backdrop to all of these feelings, and it didn't feel like a real place. I don't know, I felt kind of the same at the end of the book, too, because Ijeoma leaves her husband at the end of the book because she is f pretty much uh, forced into a marriage or nudged hard into a marriage and ultimately she leaves that marriage and then the final chapter is like this sweeping epilogue and sweeping meaning that we fly quickly over her renewed relationship with her latest girlfriend and I just think when it comes to depicting an actual relationship between two women this fell a little bit short. That being said, I recently listened to Matthew Sharapa's review of this book, and I really appreciated what he had to say about Ijeoma's mother. He reminds us that her shortcomings don't come from her being a mustache-twirling villain, but that she legitimately believes that her daughter's soul is in danger. I think I uh, focused a little bit more on Chibundu, the husband. Uh, I mean, who was a bit of a hypocrite, so like he's like, oh yeah, I don't care about uh, what the Bible says about homosexuality, but of course when it uh, comes to his own wife having feelings for a woman, <laughs> he's not quite so keen. I guess uh, I felt a little bit of empathy for that. But at the same time, it's like um, expressed through the, some sort of sexism, like he became gung-ho about uh, Ijeoma getting pregnant with a boy. He already had a girl, and for the most part he ignored her. Although that reminded me a little bit of uh, what I've heard of the novel Stay With Me, which uh, was a contender for the uh, Bailey Prize and uh, recently came out in America. And I haven't read it yet, so I can't say much, but I know that uh, it deals with uh, this uh, Nigerian cultural force that you have to have children, and particularly male children, I believe, and this uh, pressure that's put on uh, parents and that... Uh, is quite obviously a big part of Chibundu's and Ijeoma's marriage. I think what also interested me about Chibundu is that uh, he wasn't physically abusive, which would be the most mustachey, villainy thing, but he was emotionally abusive. And he also was a bit passive-aggressive and uh, had trouble moving on with his own life, although mostly I think we know that because Ijeoma tells us that uh, in her little epilogue chapter, so... 
That being said, I really do love this paragraph from near the very end, um, where throughout the book, Ijeoma has been um, confronting the uh, biblical teachings that her mother uh, foisted on her, and she says, Maybe the rules of the Bible will always be in flux. Maybe God is still speaking and will continue to do so for always. Maybe he is still creating new covenants, only we were too deaf, too headstrong, too set in our old ways to hear. Maybe it's a bit of a bias because um, last week was Rosh Hashanah and uh, my rabbi in his sermon was basically saying the same thing. He was talking about covenants and about the fact that covenants change. And he particularly brought up um, the covenant that God made with the Israelites on Sinai and then how he had to renew that uh, before they entered the land of Israel 40 years later. So that means that uh, as people and relationships change, so too do these covenants. And although, like most Christians, Ijeoma takes the New T Covenant to be the New Testament, <laughs> I'll stand in to say that many religions accept that our t sacred texts are evolving texts. And again, I feel like with LGBTQ people, the evolution of it is, is that we understand these people as defined through human relationships rather than bisexual acts. That's about it for me now. <laughs> that took a lot of time to film. I'm trying really hard to say uh, pertinent, important, meaningful things about these books that I'm so grateful that uh, I had the chance to read and to think about. I'm also sad that my cat has left me and has gone to one of her more low hiding spaces. I guess she was sick of me rambling to a camera. <laughs> she knew what I was up to even before I began in earnest. <laughs> but what can you do? I'll leave uh, written links to my Goodreads reviews of these books down below. And I'm looking forward to seeing Eric and Anna's uh, September video and any other videos on these books. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Happy October, and I'll see you next time.